Um, the major theme that I pulled out of this text is uh, how to experience God's power in our lives. How to experience God's power in our lives. And, and before we begin, if we could just take one second, if you could pray for me and then pray for one another, and just pray that each one of us would be filled with God's power in a special way during this service, that uh, members of our church, our university, would be filled with his power. So let's take a second and pray, and then we'll begin. Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word. And uh, I confess, we confess that we can't understand your scripture unless you speak, unless you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And so, Father, open us that we may receive. And Father, Lord, we confess, Lord, that I can't speak your word unless you give me the exact words to say. Um, and so, Father, give me your words that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How can we experience more of God's power in our lives? If you remember back in Genesis 15, Genesis 15, 1, um, Abraham has just conquered an army in Genesis chapter 14. He'd taken his, his nephew Lot back and protected him. Genesis 15, 1, God shows up to him and says, I am your shield. Abraham, I'm your protection. I'll guard you. I'll protect you. If you go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be right beside you. My rod and staff will protect me, protect you. In that stage, uh, Abraham learns about God's protection. And he says, Abraham, I'm your reward. Abraham had just uh, given away a tithe, the 10% of all that he owned to Melchizedek. And he also had rejected the reward from, kings, uh, from King Sodom, the king of Sodom. But God says, look, I'm enough. I'm your portion. I'm all that you need. In this text... Genesis 17, 1, God shows up to him and gives, him himself, gives, him, gives himself a different name. He says, I am El Shaddai. I am the almighty God. I am the all-powerful God. Abraham at this time is probably, thought, is probably thinking that he already has the, the seed of promise in uh, Ishmael. But he says, no, I'm about to do a work inside of you that can't but make you laugh. Um, in, your, in your wife's womb, I'm going to bring a child from you. That's going to become a mighty nation. And he says, I am the all-powerful God. For each one of us, I remember for myself when I, when I went to college at 17 years old, um, I was playing basketball at a school in Texas. And for the first time in my life, I think I started going through some of my first real hardships, my first real problems. Protected in my home, away from my home, now having to depend on my own faith. I remember coming to myself thinking, like, this is a time where I need the God that splits the Red Sea, right? This is a time I need the God that um, multiplies the bread and, and, and turns water into wine. I need to see God all-powerful. Maybe in your own life you've experienced God as your shepherd where he guides you. You've experienced God as your father who loves you. But maybe you haven't experienced this yet, El Shaddai, the all-powerful God, where he's really showed up in your life and shown miracles in your life. I believe that's God's will for every believer. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3, I believe it's verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to have fellowship with his sufferings. I even want to die like him. For Paul, to live a Christian life void of power was incredulous. How can you follow the one that multiplied bread? How can you follow the one that rose people from the dead and yet experience no power in your life? Christ, in fact, said this. He said, those who believe in me shall do greater works than these. And we see that, right, when we go to the book of Acts. Christ's ministry was primarily, uh, primarily focused on Israel. But his apostles, they turned the world upside down. The gospel goes to nations far outside of Israel. Peter preaches his first sermon. 3,000 people are saved. Christ, when he died, had 120 followers. Greater miracles than these were seen in his disciples. And I believe that's true for your life individually as a Christian. No more struggling in habitual sins that have been pulling you down for years. Beginning to see God use you, use your prayers, use your hands to care for people. God's desire is that we would be people that experience his power. The almighty God. I am El Shaddai. 
And I've showed up to do something in your life that cannot be done in your own power. How do we experience El Shaddai? How do we become a church that's known by the power of God? When people come into our service, they say, something's different. I feel his power. I feel his presence here. How can we experience El Shaddai in our lives, in our ministries? I think we can learn something about that as we look at this text. Here's the the first point. To experience God's power, we must not discount God's ability to accomplish the impossible. To experience God's power, we must not discount God's ability to accomplish the impossible. When God shows up to Abraham, as I mentioned, Abraham is probably not expecting God to do any miracles. If you remember, in the previous chapter, chapter 16, uh, Abraham takes Hagar as his wife. She is going to have a child. An angel shows up to him or shows up to her and says his name shall be Ishmael. And his descendants shall be too numerous to count. Uh, No doubt she goes back and tells Abraham this. This sounds just like the promise of the seed, right? God was going to make Abraham's seed like the stars. If you can count the stars, Abraham, then you would be able to count your seed. At this point in time, Abraham is probably not believing for God to do something miraculous like him having a child at 99 years old. Or he's 99, will be 100 soon. His wife is 89, will be 90 when she has a child. He's not expecting that God would show up in his life and do a miracle. I think this is many times the way that many Christians are. When we go through a problem or we go through some difficulty, some problems we don't even bring before God because we, or some, some ways that he could answer our situation because we think that it's too impossible. It's too impossible, and so therefore we don't pray about it. We don't bring it before God because we really have no expectation that God could do the miraculous. However, I believe that this is many times the very reason that we never see God do miracles in our lives because we have no expectation Because we don't think that God can transform a heart that's so hard and we've maybe got parents or friends that don't know Christ. We look at our nation and we say, oh, it's too impossible. We're too far gone for God to turn our nation around. The government's gone too far. This is too impossible. We've just got to go to plan B because plan A can't happen. It's too bad of a situation. This can't be changed. And this is how many people's prayer lives are. They, They settle for plan B. They settle for something that isn't impossible. However, I think that one of the reasons that we miss God's best is because we don't believe the impossible. If you remember what happened when Christ went to his hometown, Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, Matthew 13, 58, it says that he didn't do very many, very many, very, very many miracles there because of their lack of faith. In fact, if you look at Mark 6, 5, Mark 6, 5, it says he could not he could not do any miracles there except for lay a, a couple of, uh, heal a couple of people. I believe sometimes God moving in our lives in a powerful way is affected by what we're believing him for. You see it many times in the Gospels. As you believe, so it be unto you. In some places, he can't move in some churches. He can't move in some families because they have so little expectation of God. And, I believe by God's grace, God moves here with Abraham because he's already promised this to him. And one of the things that we'll see is Abraham continues his walk in the faith. We go to Genesis chapter 22. God calls for Abraham to sacrifice his son. Now, Abraham goes, he immediately obeys God, goes to sacrifice his son. Hebrews 11 tells us the very reason he does this is because he believes that God will raise him from the dead. See, at this point in Abraham's life, He's not believing God for a miracle, but one day, as he continues to go forward in his spiritual life, he starts to just expect it. God's going to raise my son from the dead if I sacrifice him. What hard situation is in your life? What ways is God calling you to believe for something that seems virtually impossible? Is it for your parents to come to know the Lord? Is it for um, your nation to be transformed? What ways is God calling for you to not discount that I can do this? I'm El Shaddai. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The first thing we can learn from Abraham is that we should not discount that God can do even the impossible. 
Here's the second one. To experience God's power, we must walk blamelessly before the Lord. We must walk blamelessly before the Lord. Um, he says this, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Now when God calls Abraham to walk blameless, he's not telling him to be sinless. He's not saying, Abraham, stop sinning, never sin again. And yet, I think he is saying that, but he's not saying that Abraham would be sinless. This word blameless actually means this in the Hebrew, to be single-hearted, to be without blame, sincere, wholly devoted to the Lord. Abraham, be single-hearted. Abraham, be wholly devoted. See, beforehand, Genesis chapter 16, he decides to compromise with the ways of his culture. In that culture, if a woman was barren, they would take, uh, uh, they would take, the many times the woman would give her mistress to her husband to bear a child through them. See, Abraham still was thinking just like, in many ways, like a Canaanite or like the people from Ur where he came from. He wasn't single-hearted. He wasn't solely focusing on God and his ability. He calls Abraham to walk. Now, in many ways, walking is probably one of the most simple things that we do, right? Uh, a child starts walking. One of the first things they, as they do as they start to develop is they start to walk. One foot in front of another. One foot. It's a, it's a, routine, uh, a routine discipline we do by walking. But one of the things we see in Scripture, those who walked with God one step at a time, I'm depending on you, I'm walking with, with you, are the ones who saw God's power, right? Genesis chapter 5, there's a man named Enoch. Um, it just says that Enoch walked with God and was no more. He, he walked with him daily. He was faithful with God, seeking his face, and he was no more. God took him straight to heaven. We learn a little bit more about Enoch in the book of Jude. We see Enoch was speaking to this perverse generation during this time, and he prophesied of the second coming before the first coming. He saw Christ coming with his uh, holy ones, it says. He was, he was, he's a prophet of God. He walked with him and was holy. His grandson, I can't remember if it's his grandson or great-grandson, the same, the same thing was said about him, Noah. Genesis chapter 6, Noah walked with God and was righteous. Unlike Enoch, Enoch, it, it, God takes him without having to go through the flood, but Noah, he goes through the flood. God um, miraculously takes him through the flood in a, in a ship he calls him to build. Those who walk with God and are blameless, who are single-hearted, they experience the power of God. He's not, he's not saying that you'll never fail, but that you are called to be focused. You're my God. Not the world, not the world system, not the pleasure of man, not the pleasure of what my parents will say. Lord, I'm walking with you. And sometimes walking with you, Lord, means sometimes I may have to walk alone. It may mean that by walking with you, I may not please my friends. I may not please my family, but I'm walking before you. I'm not walking for the esteem of the world. I'm not walking for the esteem of others. I'm walking step by step, dear Father. I'm walking with you. Those who walk with the Lord experience his power. In fact, we're going to see this with his children, right? His, his descendants, Israel. When they were walking with God, he did miracles for them. But when they chose to walk away from him, chose to be like the world, he disciplined them. They were called to go into the promised land to defeat the giants. But all of a sudden, instead of walking and being blameless, they chose to doubt his faithfulness. While in the wilderness, instead of trusting in him and believing, about, believing in him, they, they uh, complained, they were bitter, they got upset, they, they made fashioned idols and began to walk like the world. And in that moment, they ceased to experience God's power. That happens with many Christians as well. David said, if, if I cherish iniquity in my heart, you won't even hear me, God. When I'm not walking before you blamelessly and seeking to be holy in my life, you don't answer my prayers. There are many Christians like Israel walking in circles. Same trial, same failure, seeing the same tree all the time. They just keep repeating the same things in their life instead of experiencing El Shaddai. Abraham, it's time for you to experience my power. Many Christians miss it because they choose to not walk blamelessly before the Lord. 
to walk for the adoration of the world, to walk for the esteem of the world, and they miss the power of El Shaddai. Yeah, they may know him as their shepherd, and yes, they may know him as father, but they miss the experience of El Shaddai. I'm El Shaddai, Abraham, and I'm about to do things that will only make you laugh. They're so incredulous, right? Have you experienced El Shaddai? Here's the third thing. To experience God's power, we must continually be filled with the Spirit. To experience God's power, we must continually be filled with the Spirit. The next thing we see in this text, um, God says to Abraham in verse 5, No longer will you be called Abram, your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you fruitful. I will make nations out of you. Kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant and as an everlasting covenant and so on. Now, it, this, this naming, just like we see with other times where God names people in the scripture, it's a picture of a change of character, a change of destiny. It's also a picture of God's sovereignty. The fact that God names Abraham, it means that I'm your sovereign, right? Um, Naming, just as it is in our culture, in the ancient culture, is a picture of rulership. Um, Adam aimed, named all the animals that walked in front of him. Why? Because he was the ruler. Adam named his wife because God had called him to be the leader of his wife. Right? We name our children. God names Abraham because he's his sovereign. He's his ruler. But there's more to this than that. This is also, in this text, now, in this name, which means exa exalted, uh, it's, his name, Abram, means exalted father. Abraham means father of many nations. Now, the name won't jump out to us as much. But to the ancient culture, it would. Because what God does to his name is he adds a Hebrew breath sound. Ham. Abraham. It means nothing to us. But to the Hebrew culture and the ancient culture in general, it did. See, for the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew language, ruach. It, the name, it, it means, it can be translated spirit, but it's also translated wind or breath. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters, or the wind of the Lord. Genesis chapter 2, God breathed into Adam the breath of life, or the spirit of life, and he became a living being. Same thing in the Greek culture. It's, uh, in the Greek, it's pneumos. Spirit or wind. In the Latin culture, it's spiritus, spirit or wind. So when Abraham, when God puts the ha in Abraham's name, it's a picture of the breath of God, the wind. He does the same thing with Sarai. Sarai's name actually already means princess. But he, named, he puts the ah, Sarah. You can't say it without the breath sound, Sarah. You're going to be a princess but you're going to be a, spirit, a princess by my breath, by my spirit. In the, God was going to fulfill this covenant with Abraham by his spirit. His spirit was going to enable Abraham, whose body is as good as dead, and Sarah, whose body is as good as dead, by his spirit, Abraham was going to have a child in his old age. And it's the same way for us. Same way in the New Testament. We see Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8, Christ tells the disciples, stay here and wait. You're going to be endowed with power from on high by my spirit. You're going to turn the world upside down, not by your own power, not by the fact that you know the scriptures, but by my spirit, God says to his apostles. It's the same way for us. Now, how do we experience the spirit of God in our life, in our ministry, our marriages, our schoolwork, how do we experience El Shaddai in our ministries? Now, here's two things, um, two different ministries of the Holy Spirit. One is called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When you become born again, Scripture says that the Spirit of God comes and indwells you. Romans 8 says if we don't have the Spirit, then we're not children of God. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He indwells you and he stays with you forever. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. He indwells you. If you've been born again, you have received the Spirit. Here's a second ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
Well, there's many ministries, but the second one we're going to talk about. One is called the filling of the Holy Spirit. If we went to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Ephesians 5, 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, but be fi- which leads to dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, this word filled is a continuous action. Um, to be continually filled. You have one indwelling. When you're saved, the Spirit of God indwells you. But as a believer, there are continual feelings. Continual feelings. Continual times where God will empower you. Maybe you're talking to a friend uh, about Christ. And you find that God just gives you the exact words to say. Maybe you come to church and you feel the Spirit of God move upon you. Um, and he empowers you to worship him or breaks a depression that's on you. There are many fillings in the believer's life, or there should be. We're actually commanded, be filled. Experience this every day. Now, I, one of the reasons I think he compares it to being drunk with wine, I think it's kind of like being drunk with wine. One, a person who's under the influence of wine is controlled. One person, I've never been drunk in my life, but I've had lots of friends that were. I remember I had one friend that used to... I don't know, maybe I shouldn't talk about this, but oh well. <laughs> I remember I had one friend that he would drink, and he would become very lovey. Oh, Greg, I love you, man. you like the coolest dude ever, Greg. I love you, man, right? I just love it. Became very loving, right? One person, I had a friend that used to drink, and he would become angry, violent. The spirit would, I mean, the, the alcohol would make him violent. One person, he's shy, won't talk to anybody. All of a sudden, he's talking to everybody, Right? He's talking to all these different people. The alcohol would control them. And he says, don't be controlled by alcohol. Be controlled by the Spirit. And when a person is controlled by alcohol, they have to continually drink it. They have to continually put it in. He says, in the same way, if you're going to be empowered by the Spirit of God, to have a ministry that's known by the breath of God, you've got to continually fill yourself with the Spirit of God. How do we do this? If we went to verses 19 through 21, I believe what he's giving us is part of the ways. The way, I think it's a result of being filled with the Spirit, but it's also the method. How do we become filled to have the breath of God in our lives? He says, let's go ahead and read this together. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He mentions four things. One of of them is corporate worship. Speak to one another. One of the ways that you're filled with the Spirit is by doing what we've been doing. Worshiping together. And as you worship together, you're filled. The second thing is, uh, he says, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Individual worship. Some people only worship when they come to, to, to HIC. They don't worship at home. They're not worshipers. They're not singing psalms and hymns throughout the week, making melody in your heart. We see this in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 15. Jehoshaphat and Ahab, two kings, um, king of the north and the south of Israel, they come to Elisha and they say, prophesy. Tell us whether we should go to battle. What does Elisha say? He says, uh, get the harpist. The harpist comes, he plays. The hand of the Lord comes upon Elisha and he prophesies. In the midst of worship, the power of God came down upon Elisha. One of the ways that you're filled by the Spirit is by being a worshiper. By worshiping, giving him praise and thanksgiving. The third way, he says, with gratitude in our hearts to the Lord. He says, giving gratitude for everything in our hearts to the Lord. Some people can't be filled with the Spirit of God. Why? Because they're complainers. They're bitter, they complain about this, they complain about that, they're angry. They're not people that are giving thanks in everything. The people that, people that are, uh, are thankful Christians that practice the discipline of thanksgiving, like Job, Lord, you give, Lord, you take away, blessed be the name of the Lord, even in trial, right? Even in trial, these are the people that are filled with the Spirit of God. I believe they're filled and it gives them grace to give thanksgiving, but also You become filled by giving thanksgiving. He says, submitting to one another um, in the Lord, or uh, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The person that's always in discord, fighting, and bickering, 
not willing to humble themselves in their relationship, to make themselves low, to forgive those who will not submit to one another, they'll find that they can't be filled with the Spirit of God. They can't have the power of God in their lives. How else are we filled with the Spirit? We're filled with the Spirit outside of this passage. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. We see that the apostles have just been forbidden to speak in the name of Christ. So what they do is they, get, they come together in Acts 4.31 and they have a prayer meeting. And it says they prayed and the building that they were at was shaken. And they were all filled with the Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. One of the ways that you become more filled with the Spirit to have the breath of God in your life, to start to see his empowerment in your ministry, is by becoming a person of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, pray in all things. He says, pray without ceasing. He says, pray without ceasing, right? The more you're praying individually and corporately, you'll find that you'll have more power in your life. Sadly, when we're busy, when it's midterm week, the first thing that goes many times is our prayer life. Oh, I just don't have time. I just don't have time to pray. I'm too busy to pray, right? The first thing that goes when you get busy in your life is you forget to pray. But praying is the exact thing you need to do if you're going to have the power of God in your life, right? Here's the next one. Um, if we're going to be filled with the Spirit of God, we must dwell in the Word of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. It's almost a parallel passage to Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Um, Colossians 3, 16 through 18. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. If you'll notice, this passage, it says a lot of the same things that be filled with the Spirit is. Singing psalms and hymns, right? It talks about having gratitude and everything. It talks about submission. When the Word of God is dwelling in you, two Greek words for dwell. One is to dwell as a visitor. This one is to be at home. If you come into my, if you come into my apartment, you might say, Pastor Greg, where's the bathroom at? Or, Pastor Greg, um, where's... Can I get a Bible for Bible study, right? And you don't know where things are because you're a visitor. That's how a lot of Christians are with the Word of God. They're not, it's not at home in them. They don't know where things are. They don't know the Bible. It's not, they haven't, it hasn't become at home in them. And when it is at home in you, then all of a sudden you naturally become a teacher. When it is at home in you, then you naturally become one that starts to give thanks in all things. When it becomes at home in you, you become a worshiper. When you are, the Word of God dwells in you, the Spirit of God is, is uh, filling you. Because the Spirit is the author of the Word of God. And one of the ways the Spirit of God controls you is by the Word of God being at home in your life. Right? Many Christians have no power in their life because the Word of God isn't at home. They're like a visitor. Oh, maybe I'll read the Bible today. Maybe I won't. Right? Maybe I'll read the Bible this week. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll miss it for this month. They're visitors. Instead of allowing the word of God to be at home in their lives, right? We see with Abraham that God adds the breathy sound. Breath, which is a reference to the spirit in that ancient culture. To them it would have jumped out, maybe not to us. Um, and it was a picture of his spirit. By my spirit, you will walk blamelessly. By my spirit, I will make you a great nation. By my spirit, I will do this miracle and give you a son. In the same way. There are some things, many things, that can't be done in your own flesh that you need the Spirit of God to do for you. You need the Spirit of God, but you must be filled. It's a daily command every day. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Oh, Lord, empower me to be a, to be a light. Oh, Lord, empower me to be a witness. Oh, Lord, empower me to persevere in this trial. Oh, Lord, give me the self-control that's a fruit of the Spirit. Oh, Lord, give me joy. Oh, Lord, fill my church. It's a command for each one of us. Each day you are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Are you getting drunk on the Spirit? Are you continually drinking it? Is it the first discipline, your first priority every day? First priority is to be filled 
with the Spirit of God, many Christians never experience God's power because they're not willing to be filled. Here, here's the next one. To experience God's power, we must have a revelation of our weakness. To experience God's power, we must have a revelation of our weakness. Genesis 17, verses 10 through 14 says this. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep, every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you for generations to come. Every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money, and so on. Now, what was circumcision to the Jew? Obviously, it's the, the, the cutting off of the flesh on the, the reproductive organ of the male. Um, but this, this was a common practice. Not a, it, was a, it wasn't an uncommon practice in, in those days. It wasn't the first time. The Jews weren't the first to do it. Um, but what this symbolized was an inner work in the heart of Abraham and his disciples or his, his, his children. Um, it's almost like baptism. Baptism, when you're baptized, is a picture of the fact that you have already been baptized in Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we have all been baptized by one spirit into one body. You have become part of the body of Christ. And you died with him. You were resurrected with him. And it's a picture of what's already happened in your life, right? It's, it's, not, the, it's not what happened. It's a symbol of it. In the same way, circumcision was meant to be a symbol of what was happening in Abraham's heart. Look at these passages. Je uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Jeremiah 4, verse 4. Circumc circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you men of Judah. And people of Jerusalem, or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. Um, circumcision was a picture of circumcision of the heart. I'm set apart to God. I'm set apart. We, my, my family is going to be set apart, not from, set apart from the world to walk with God. Sadly, in the Jewish culture, circumcision became a, a way of salvation to them. Um, it became a method of being saved. But it was never meant to be that. In fact, in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 2, Paul says, if a person is circumcised but they don't have a right heart, their circumcision does no good. It means nothing. Um, the real Jew is circumcised of the heart. It's an inner nature. Um, with that said, circumcision in this text seemed to mean a little bit more than that. Let me read to you what a couple of commentators said. This is what Kent Hughes, Kent Hughes said. Significantly, circumcision involved Abraham's powers of procreation. The area of life in which he had resorted to fleshly expedience and had, had so failed. Man's best plans and strength, man's best plans and strength of will would never bring about the promise. For Abraham, circumcision was an act of repentance and a sign of dependence upon God for promise. James Boyce, a famous Presbyterian pastor scholar, said this, The cutting away of the flesh meant the renunciation of human effort, which arises out of the flesh, and the willingness to bear about in the body the mark of the individual's identification with God. Now, I said all that to say, Abraham, by circumcision, would always be reminded how he had tried to fulfill the promise in his own flesh. Genesis chapter 16, he went off and tried to have a son in his own power, marrying Hagar, taking someone from the world, and for the rest of his life, it would be a picture of, I couldn't do it in my own effort. There was no power in my life to fulfill God's will, right? He would always be reminded. His children, who were going to be fighting in war with this opposite seed for the rest of their life, they're still fighting right now in this war, it would always be a reminder, it could not be done in the flesh. The flesh profits nothing, Scripture says, but the Spirit is life. In order for you to experience the power of God, you have got to come to the end of your flesh, the end of your power. And many times, because your flesh is so prideful, what God will do in your life is he'll bring the storm, he'll bring, allow you to fail, to mess up, to make mistakes, so you can say, I can't be done on my own. I can't do it. I need God. I need his power. 
And so many times, by his grace, he allows the failures. So you may know that it can only be done through him. It can only be done through his power. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Many times the very work that God has to do in your life, just like with Abraham, Abraham goes down to Egypt, he lies about his wife, almost loses his wife, and God shows him. He protects him, protects her while she's in Pharaoh's Pharaoh's harem, and he says, look, Abraham, not by your power, not by your power. Abraham, again, here we see here that Abraham goes and has a child, and God says, look, Abraham, not by your power. Not by your power, but by my spirit. For the rest of his life, he would have been reminded that it couldn't be done in his flesh. In the same way, I think, I think we get somewhat of a picture of that with Jacob, right? Jacob, the swindler, who always tried to do things on his own, didn't rely on God, even though he's the child of promise, like Abraham. And God wrestles with him, and he touches his thigh, and he hollows it. And for the rest of his life, he would limp. He would limp, and it was a reminder Not by your power, Jacob. Not by your power. Are you still trying to do it in your own power? Are you trying to do it by man's wisdom, like Abraham in Genesis 16? The world says you must do this. The world says you must do that. And you're trucking along, doing what the world says, instead of trucking along with God and his power. Many times we miss the power of God because we rely so much on our flesh, on our knowledge, our wisdom, our strength, instead of learning how to trust in God. Paul later on says in 2 Corinthians 12 that he would boast in his weakness because God's power was made perfect in his weakness, right? One of the things that we must come to a realization of if we are going to experience God's power is that it can't be done in our flesh. We're too weak. One of the reasons that many of you never experience God's power is because you're too independent. James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7 says... um, He fights against the proud. Let me quote it before I mess it up. Um, James 4, 7. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The proud walks on his own. The proud doesn't depend on God, isn't living in the word, isn't living in prayer. He can make it through the day on his own. He doesn't need God. Why does he need to rely on God? So he goes on his own. And what happens, the way this person experiences God is God gets in war gear against him. He fights against this proud person. Why? So he can become weak. So he can become humble and experience the grace of God. Are you the prideful walking on your own, your own power, your own wisdom, the wisdom of this world? Or are you the weak one? You're the weak one that experiences the power of God, the humble that receives his grace. Paul talks about the believer in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. I think it's verse 4. Verse 3 actually. For it is we who are the circumcision... We who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3.3. Again, I think he's symbolizing circumcision there. We are the true circumcision. Why? Because we realize the flesh profits nothing. In my own power, I can do nothing. If you are truly saved and you've known that you can't be saved by your righteousness, you can't be saved by your works, you must depend fully on God. But you learn this not only for salvation, But in your daily life, we are the circumcision, and we put no confidence in our flesh. Amen? Amen. I'll say amen to my amen. 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 Here's the last one. To experience God's power, we must be selfless. Selfless. To experience God's power, we must be selfless. Where do we see this? I think, I, I think we get a little bit of this in Abraham's response to Ishmael. God has promised uh, Abraham that he's going to have a child from Sarah. And Abraham cries out. He says, oh, Lord. He cries out and says, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. He cries out for his son. It wasn't, see, for many people, 
to experience God's power, it's about them. It's about, I want God's power for my glory, for God to do this to me so people can see me. But for Abraham to experience the blessing of God, he wanted it for his son and for his seeds. He says, oh Lord, I pray that my son would live and dwell under your blessing. Um, There's a man in the book of Acts who wanted to experience God's power for his own blessing. His name was Simon. If we looked at Acts chapter 8, verse 20 through 23, I'll just tell you the story. Acts 8, 20 through 23. Simon sees Peter laying hands on people, and they are receiving the Holy Spirit. Simon was a, a magician, and he had, he, he had accepted Christ as Lord. Simon comes to Peter with money, and he says, give me money. Or he, says, he says, here's money. He said, here's money. Let me have this power that I also may lay hands on people so that they may experience the the Spirit. Peter curses Simon. He says, I've discerned that you have nothing to do with this covenant. Basically nothing to do with God. He's saying that he's truly an unbeliever. He says, repent of your sins that God may forgive you. History says Simon went back to being a magician and became a a false prophet. Created his own cult and etc. Many people fell away. See, Simon wanted to experience the power of God for his own blessing, right, for his own privilege. Um, No doubt when we see Paul cry out in Philippians 3.10, I want to experience um, the power of the resurrection. It wasn't for his glory. It wasn't for himself. He wanted power so when he prayed that truly people would be blessed. And when he preached that people would truly be transformed. Many people don't experience God's power, don't experience his blessing because it's all about self. James chapter 4, verses 2 through 3 says this. James 4, 2 through 3, talking about these scattered Jews. Um, You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. God says to him, he says to this church, these people that are fighting and bickering, He says, you're selfish. The reason I don't answer your prayers, the reason you're not seeing me move in your life is because it's all about you. And one of the ways you can tell it's all about you is because you're just like the world. You're warring, you're fighting. People have even died in this church or this congregation. It's all about you. And when you don't get your way, you fight, you have discord. Instead of humbling yourself, it's not about others. Philippians chapter 2, I think it's verse 3, says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Uh, But consider others better than yourself. I think that's what we see in Abraham's life. Remember in Genesis chapter 13, Abraham and Lot uh, have a little discord. Abraham says what? Take the best of the land. You choose. Even though he's the patriarch, he's a man that's selfless. I believe people who are selfless, that that really want to see, Lord, may my church dwell under your blessing. Lord, may my university dwell under your blessing. Lord, may my nation dwell under my blessing. When you look throughout history, the ones that God has used the most, they are people that aren't concerned about themselves. They've given up themselves. They've taken up their cross. They're willing to serve others instead of to be served. And it's those that God uses in the most mighty ways. Abraham, take the best. Lord, bless Ishmael. The power of God was not for himself. As we look at Abraham, I think we cannot but see a picture of Christ. Christ, the Son of God, he was given a name by God. Christ, the Son of God, he was filled with the Spirit from the womb. Christ, the Son of God, he was weak, he was weary, he was weary unto death. Christ, the Son of God, had the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, I cast out demons by the finger of the Holy Spirit. When you look at Christ, I think we cannot but see his grandfather, Abraham. When you look at Christ, he says, it's it's necessary for me to fulfill all righteousness. And Christ was a man that was known by the power of God. He was a man that God used greatly. Are you willing, are we willing to not discount that God can do the miraculous? He can transform Handong. He can turn this nation around. Sometimes I catch myself with these small prayers. I think, oh, America's gone too back. We're just going to slide all the way down and keep going. Instead of thinking, oh, my God. Nothing's too impossible for you. Sometimes I almost think that we've just got to settle. This has already happened. We've got to settle. Many times we're like that as well. We've just got to settle. 
Ishmael's a donkey of man. He's, he's disobedient, but Lord, let your blessing be upon him. He says, no, no, no. Many t- One of the things that we must do if we're going to see the, mirac- the miraculous of God, see El Shaddai, is not disca- discard or discount that he can do the impossible. Are you still believing for God to do the impossible? Um, the next thing we see is we must walk blamelessly with the Lord. It says in James chapter 5, um, uh, the prayers of the righteous availeth much. The prayers of those who are walking with the Lord. However, when I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord doesn't even hear me. Are you willing to be holy so that you can be used by the power of God? We must be filled by the Holy Spirit. We must have a revelation of our weakness. We are the circumcision who, do, who put, no, um, put no trust in our flesh. Are you still thinking you can do it on your own? Are you trusting God? Do you know your weakness? And maybe by God's grace, your trial is just so that you may know how weak you really are. Maybe you're experiencing something that's like death so that you can experience the power of the resurrection, like Paul said, in your life. That's a grace of God. Finally, are you willing to be selfless? Oh, Lord, let this nation dwell under your blessing. Oh, Lord, um, be glorified amongst Handong. Let's take a second. Let's take a second to respond in prayer. I want to invite EPT up so we can have some time of worship. As we pray...